Good morning, welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 16th of April and this quick look at the week ahead beginning the 9th of April with me, Michael Hewson. Before we get started, just um, put up a couple of risk warnings, but I think it's fairly safe to say that this week has been a fairly positive week for equity markets in general. We've seen record highs in the likes of the Eurostox 50, the DAX, the Stock 600, the FTSE 250, the S&P 500 and the Dow. Other indexes have indeed lagged behind, but certainly I think the prognosis for equity markets continues to look by and large fairly positive. This is despite um, improvements, and I say despite improvements in economic data, um, because normally what happens or what has been happening this year when economic data has come out much better than expected is bond yields have gone up. That hasn't happened over the course of the past few days, which is slightly counterintuitive. Um, and the reason, and, I'll, and I'll, I'll, ex, I'll explain that because ultimately um, the slide in yields that we've seen over the course of the past few days has been, has been particularly puzzling simply um, because that for the past three months, yields have been on the rise due to concerns about higher prices, higher level, perceived concerns about higher levels of inflation and a strong economic recovery driven by large scale fiscal and monetary stimulus, both of which, all of which we're currently seeing. Weekly jobless claims at a post pandemic low of 576,000. We've seen CPI numbers come out higher than expected. Now it's easy, it's easy to dismiss the CPI numbers. Why? Simply because um, you're, you, you're having to take into account base effects. Inflation, inflation measurements a year ago were much, much lower than they are now, simply because most of the global economy was in lockdown. That has a deflationary effect on prices. So if you're, if you're comparing uh, a deflationary shock um, a year later to prices now, you're always going to have slightly elevated prices. Yes, there are concerns, certainly I think in terms of prices paid, data that has been trending quite a bit higher. That is largely down to supply chain constraints. Um, but overall, um, the data has been by and large fairly positive. And certainly in terms of the retail sales numbers that we saw out of the US, um, I did flag last week that we were likely to get a fairly decent beat on the basis of the fact that the stimulus checks, US stimulus checks hit the doormats in March. And it would have been surprising, would it not, if we didn't get a significant rebound in retail sales off the back of that. And that's exactly what we got, 9.8%. So what does that mean for inflation expectations going forward? Because ultimately, we got the data we expected and yields fell back. Um, so I think for me, we can extrapolate that a number of ways, either that the recovery is in the price already. Certainly, I think there is there is an argument for that, or that markets think that this could be as good as it gets. Now, personally, I don't think this is as good as it gets, because the latter point doesn't bear up to scrutiny, given that the April payrolls data, which is due in two weeks time, could well be even stronger than the March 916,000 new jobs that were added. So I think what we could be seeing here is perhaps a temporary leg lower before we get further upward pressure on yields. Maybe the market was so one way that it had nowhere else to go but down. Now, certainly in terms of the price action that we're looking at here, in terms of the 10 year yield, what is significant, and this is a warning sign, is we've broken below the 158.75 lows from the 25th of March. There was a double tap there on the downside. We closed below that. Now, what really needs to happen is for us to hold below 160. Now, obviously, if we move back above 160, that doesn't necessarily mean we're out of the woods. We do appear to be now in a slightly shorter term downtrend 
for US 10 year Treasury yields. So maybe the top is in. We don't know yet. The data could get better. It certainly won't be anywhere near as good in terms of retail sales, but certainly the labor market has potential to improve further. So the big question is, is how well does the labor market continue to improve? But also what do prices do relative to the improvement in the labor market? And that is likely, I think, to drive US bond yields over the course, long-term bond yields over the course of the next two to three months. So at the moment, we appear to be capped around about 175. I think the next key support area is likely to be this low here, around about 147, 148. Take 150, I think, probably as a fairly key support level overall. It's a nice round number. But overall, there does appear to be a slight change in emphasis now and that potentially we could start to see bond yields start to, to trickle off a little bit if the upcoming inflation data starts to show signs of leveling, leveling off. Certainly the markets appear to be pricing that in. So that's something that we'll be paying particular attention to over the coming days. And I think that's what is helping to boost equity markets as well. I think diminishing um, fears about rampant inflation, I mean, I, th I don't think that was ever likely, irrespective of your views on the scale of the stimulus that's coming our way. There's still a significant demand shortfall at the moment. And I think, at, you know, while there's, there is a demand deficit, it's going to be very difficult for prices to start running away. We've seen an improvement in the latest Chinese economic data. China GDP um, rose and annualized 18.3% in the first quarter. Again, base effects account for the extent of that rebound. In the first quarter of last year, the Chinese economy was in lockdown. Um, same applies to the retail sales numbers. But I think one thing about the China retail sales numbers is that finally we appear to be seeing clear evidence that the Chinese economy is rebalancing more towards services and away from manufacturing. And that is a good thing. A 50-50 split between the two is generally uh, a positive. Um, so, you know, going, going forward, I think the outlook still remains fairly positive for stock markets in general. Now, you can argue about you know, whether or not valuations are justifiable at current levels. But at the end of the day, we're not talking about the fundamentals here. We're talking about price. And you can say, well, surely price reflects fundamentals. Well, yes and no. But price also reflects the amount of available liquidity that's sloshing around in the market. That liquidity has to go somewhere. So essentially, it goes into the markets. Now, if we look at the FTSE 100, we've broken higher. We finally hit that 7,000 level. Whoever said patience is a virtue um, is a liar because it's been such a long time coming. But finally, we do appear to be seeing signs of the FTSE 100 on the cusp of potentially starting to ratchet its way higher. It's still got quite some way to go until we get all the way back here in the back of 2020 when we saw um, 7, 6, 8, 9, 7,700. But we appear to be... Um, on the way there, assuming we can hold above this 7,000 level um, that we broke about at the end, we've broken above at the end of this week. But I've still got an end of year target on the FTSE 100, maybe a little bit conservative, around about 7,400. So FTSE 250 has already made record highs. If we look at the German DAX, it's a similar sort of story. We've finally broken towards the upside after trading sideways three or four days but we can see quite clearly from this chart here we have a series of lows all the way through 15,140 so stands to reason if we get a dip back there's likely to be very key support in and around this series of lows through here again the trend is your friend do not try and pick the top you're in the middle of an uptrend and the only reason to look at shorting a particular market or selling a particular market is if you're already long. It's very much a case of the trend is your friend until it comes to an end. And I know that sounds very cliched and I make no apology for it because ultimately it's the way that um, any sensible trader should trade markets. You trade with the trend, not against it. Um, here again, the S&P 500, once again, new record highs this week. 
Um, next target now, 4,200. So where's the support level I hear you cry? Well, again, I think if we're looking at um, the levels over the course of the past few days, we can see there's fairly decent support in and around 4,100. The lows there um, on the 12th of April, and obviously the lows on the 13th of April, 4,100 is as good a support level as any, given the fact that we found decent support there on Monday and Tuesday of this week. We're now at 41.68, but it certainly does appear to be where the market wants to go. The NASDAQ is underperforming a little bit. Again, that worries me uh, uh, somewhat, but nonetheless, what we have finally seen is a break higher on the NASDAQ through 14,000. Um, certainly we can see there's decent support all the way through these lows through here around about 13,780. Um, again, it's looking for levels where the market has rebounded from. Now, if you want to drill down into slightly greater detail on that, it's fairly easy to do. We can do that here. And we can see throughout the week, this week, we found fairly decent buying interest in and around 13,780. So very easy to drill down into the detail. You can see that there and um, gives you a much clearer idea of where the key support and resistance levels are. So as I say, we've, we've looked at all of them and now we can look ahead with a little bit of confidence, I think, in terms of um, what's coming up in the week ahead. And it's quite a, it's quite a busy week by all accounts. It's probably um, it's going to be a key focus on the UK economy, which brings me on to the subject of the pound, which has looked incredibly weak over the course of the past few days. And I'm struggling to explain the reasons for that. In the same way, I'm struggling a little bit to explain why Treasury yields are as weak as they are, given the strength of the economic data that we've been seeing coming out of the US. Nonetheless, you can't ignore what the price action is doing. We've had a good run higher in the value of the pound over the course of the past few weeks and months. And maybe now is a time for a little bit of a reassessment as to where we go to next. But at the moment, the Sterling Index, the CMC Sterling Index, is finding support at the bottom end of this downward channel that we're seeing here. So maybe there's a perception perhaps that we're starting to find, or we're trying to stretch, we're trying to find a bottom, basically. Um, and certainly I think that's particularly prevalent in the way that euro sterling has been behaving that's been the ultimate pain trade if you're um, playing a short position certainly in terms of where i see euro sterling i don't like it here i think it's probably needs to be lower but nonetheless i think so does everybody else and that's why i think it can start to become what is perceived to be a little bit of a crowded trade so that makes this week's coming economic data out of the uk that much more important. Obviously, the, the 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 rally in the pound has been largely as a result of the successful vaccination program that's being rolled out and perceptions that the economic recovery here in the UK will be much stronger than, say, for Europe than than, than Europe. Now, Europe is obviously behind in its vaccination program, but by and large, the data that we've been seeing out of Europe has, despite the evidence of a third wave been improving ever so slightly on a month-on-month -month basis. Certainly in terms of the flash PMIs that we've got coming out later in the week from France, Germany and the UK, it's been clear for several months now that economic activity between services and manufacturing has been diverging. Nonetheless, we have started to see a little bit of improvement in services relative to manufacturing. Manufacturing has been very, very good certainly in terms of the PMIs out of France and Germany, but we're starting to see evidence of a little bit of divergence between the French manufacturing PMIs and the actual hard data, because February manufacturing and industrial production for France was absolutely dreadful at the same time as the PMIs were fairly positive. So there is a little bit of a divergence there which is difficult to explain just by looking at the PMIs. So we need to be a little bit careful about that. Nonetheless, we've got the flash PMIs for April coming out later in the week, and they should give us a good indication as to whether or not services is going to continue to improve going forward. 
Um, so keep keep an eye for, keep an eye out for them, given the fact that we're getting large second waves of infections in Germany and France, and see whether or not the improvements that we saw in March are sustained. Um, I suspect they may find it they may find it difficult to do so. But in terms of the UK data that we've got coming out, I think the big level on euro sterling is highlighted on the chart that you can see in front of you right now. It's around about 87.30. Um, there is evidence perhaps that the shorts in sterling are starting to get a little bit squeezed and we could see further squeezing if we break above 87.30, 87.40. So that for me, I think is the key level going forward. If we do break high, we'll probably get a sharp move to 88 and the 100 day moving average. But nonetheless, my bias still remains for a stronger pound and a weaker euro. Um, we've also got the European Central Bank rate meeting, so there could be a little bit of what I would call position squaring ahead of that, because I think some of the narrative out of the European Central Bank in the past few weeks has been not as dovish, perhaps, as you'd like it to be. There's been, I think there's significant divisions on the governing council about the scale of the asset purchase programme that's currently being rolled out across the Euro area. You've had a, a number of members, French Central Bank Governor, for example, the Villaroy Gahal, basically saying that he wants to terminate the asset purchase programme by March 2022, which will be well ahead of any potential tightening from the Federal Reserve. So that's giving a slight upward bias to Euro against the dollar. And obviously that is bleeding through also against the pound. So, um, I think that explains to some extent why the euro has started to gain ground a little bit, I think, in terms of um, the other currency pairs, because I think Christine Lagarde's going to find it much more difficult to draw a consensus on future monetary policy decisions going forward if um, the vaccination programme continues to get rolled out, particularly across Germany um, and France and the rest of Europe and essentially the consensus could start to fracture as we head into the end of Q2 and the beginning of Q3. But as they say, a week is a long time in politics, there's an even shorter time in financial markets. Anyway, uh, moving swiftly on, still think Euro sterling, big level 87.30, keep an eye on that. But overall, my bias still remains for a stronger pound, weaker Euro. Um, which brings me on to the data that we've got out over the course of the next few days. So we've got um, UK unemployment for February on the 20th of April. We've also got the jobless claims numbers. Now, obviously, I think what's less important about um, the unemployment numbers is the fact that they are very much a lagging indicator. Um, certainly, I think while the furlough is still in place, there is a certain element of disguising the true level of unemployment. But I think what is encouraging is that business optimism at its highest level for 13 years and vacancies are starting to rise as well. So while unemployment may go a little bit higher over the course of the next few months, expectations are that it will actually peak at a much lower level. So the ILO measure of unemployment is expected to see a modest tick down in February to um, or sort of saw, saw a tick down in January to 5% slipping back from 5.1% in December. It's likely to stay around those sorts of levels in the February numbers. What was more surprising was that we saw a big rise in jobless claims from 7.2% to 7.5. So it'll be interesting to see in terms of the March jobless claims as to whether or not we start to see them slip back, given the fact that we're starting to see vacancies start to rise again. Um, we still can't disguise the reality. There are 700,000 fewer jobs in the UK economy since this time last year. Obviously, most of those losses are in the hospitality sector and in the under age 25 cohort. So, you know, I think I think these these could be a key indicator as to whether or not we're starting to see early signs of a peak in the monthly jobless claims numbers and whether or not we start to see them come down. We've also got UK retail sales for March. We're not likely to see the type of retail sales gains that we saw in the US, far from it, because ultimately um, there haven't been any stimulus checks hitting doormats here in the UK, and the UK economy was still 
locked down in March as well. So we saw a big slide in UK retail sales in January of 8.2%. Um, in February, this saw a modest reversal of 2.1% as people took advantage of garden centres and DIY centres still being open. 16% rise in household goods helped offset a 50% decline in clothing sales. I think anyone expecting a big jump in March could well be disappointed, but we could still see um, some fairly decent activity in DIY and garden centres as people look to um, the planting season when it comes to um, looking ahead for uh, the spring. And certainly I think in terms of the UK GDP numbers, we have seen a much shallower contraction in January and February than was originally feared. So I th certainly think in terms of how the UK consumer um, is feeling, I think there is a growing sense of optimism as we head towards a further unlocking of the economy, not only here in April, but also in May, um, when indoor hospitality starts to reopen as well. Public sector borrowing, yeah, well, less said about that, the better. But I think what we can say is it's likely to come in at a record level. A, another £19.1 billion was added to the national debt in February, and net borrowing rose to £278 billion year to date, um, with this week's March number expected to see borrowing get close to and even probably push above £300 billion. Now, this needs to be put in perspective. It's still lower than was originally forecast a few months ago and has been helped by a number of businesses returning their furlough money and business rates money as they successfully adapted their business models to a much more online operation. So, you know, I think it really depends on whether you're a glass half full or a glass half empty person. Personally, I think given where we are at the moment, I'm probably more glass half full. Um, and, and as such, given the fact that everyone, pretty much everyone is in the same boat, I think whatever the public sector borrowing numbers are at the moment, UK gilt yields are still around about 0.73%. So it's eminently serviceable, even if it is eye-wateringly high. As I say, we, we are not alone in that regard. And we've also got flash PMIs for April coming out for the UK economy. And they're likely to be good and fairly positive as well, given the fact that we saw a big jump in UK services PMI in March as companies started to restock ahead of the reopening in April. So hopefully now that we've seen a partial reopening of the economy in April, that trend will continue. So brings me on to sterling dollar, pound dollar, cable, whatever you want to call it. Still big support, 136.70. That's the key line in the sand for further cable losses for me. On the upside, we're struggling to get much above 138.20, 138.30. If you want to keep abreast of my updates on that, you can find them in the chart forum right there. They can be seen here. So I put, a, put, a, put an update here. We've seen four, four days of gains this week. I think the thing that worries me a little bit about this is the, the lack of really an impulsive rebound off those 136.70 lows. But while 136.70 holds, I still think that ultimately the pound should break higher. So that's the key line in the sand for me with respect to cable 136.70. We can talk about euro dollar as well. We've seen a decent rebound in that. And it does look as if we could well be about to start heading higher. So the big question then becomes if euro dollar goes higher, does it take cable with it or does it push euro or, or does it take euro sterling higher? Now, it is looking very overbought, but at the moment, I'm choosing to disregard that because ultimately it clouds my thinking. It's a question of what's the price doing. So the next resistance level is, is here. It's currently where we are at the moment. It's around about 119, 80, 120. If we can hold below that, we should start to roll back over. But if we're able to push above 120, then it's quite likely stop losses will get triggered and we will push higher. So it's really about mechanics. It's about how, if you're looking to short euro dollar, where do you put your stop loss? 
where would you put it? You put it at one just above 120. Um, and if 120 goes bid, it will go 1020. Then we'll probably like to, we'll probably see a row of stops taken out, and we'll probably head back to around about 120 and a half. But while we're below 120, then the likelihood is we'll drift back down to rules around about 119, 80, 120, 20. So it's really about levels, trading levels when you're trading currencies. If you forget that lesson for any minute, you're likely to get burnt. Pick your levels and trade the levels accordingly. Okay, so as I say, UK retail sales, 23rd, public sector borrowing, 23rd, UK ILO unemployment, jobless claims, 20th of April, ECB rate meeting on the 22nd of December. How does Madame Lagarde basically bring together the divergent views of what the ECB can and can't do over the course of the of the next few months? Certainly PEP will be front and center. Um, and ultimately, how do they see the outlook for the Eurozone economy? I would imagine that it'll be a copy and paste from the last meeting, but who knows. Um, moving on, it's also um, set to be a big week um, for company earnings. We've already seen US bank earnings this week. They've been by and large extremely positive as loan loss reserves get basically rotated back onto the bank's balance sheets and thus helping to boost profits. But nonetheless, we've seen some really decent numbers over the course of the past few months. Um, one other question that I was asked as a, as a result of um, one of these videos was, could I do some, could I cover some more exotic currencies? Um, I, will, I will try and do that if time permits, but ultimately I think one thing about these particular videos is that they preview what's topical in the week ahead and say something like sterling Mexican or dollars or dollar South African Rand is probably not that topical. But what I can do is I can update the chart forums for those currency pairs. And that's what I've done with sterling, Mex and dollar South African Rand. They're in the chart forums. You can find the chart forums in the news and analysis section there. You display it there and it displays it here. So sterling, Mex, for example, I put some chart analysis in there. You just click on that button there and then it displays it there. And the analysis is displayed in the left hand column there. So the chart forums is a great vehicle for um, essentially um, posting analysis of a particular market and essentially inviting feedback if you want it from other like-minded traders. Okay, so moving on, we've got company earnings from the likes of Associated British Foods, Johnson & Johnson, Taylor Wimpy and Netflix. Um, so I'm going to start with Netflix, given the fact that we are potentially coming out of lockdown and Netflix is starting to find competition heating up from the likes of Amazon Prime, uh, Disney and uh, Apple. And they, those, those, those companies will be reporting in the week beginning the 26th of April. But in particular, Netflix, I'm particularly interested in Netflix because it's the market leader. Now, at the end of last year, Netflix managed to show it's fending off the challenges from the likes of Disney Plus, Apple TV and Amazon Prime by reporting 8.51 million new subscribers and posting revenues of $6.64 billion in its final Q4 numbers. Now, this is key because it also projected that subscriber numbers in this first quarter would rise by 6 million, with profits expected to come in around about $3 a share. Now, Despite the challenges being posed across the entire sector, next Netflix has still been able to increase its prices, which means the big question, given the fact that it's increased its prices in this quarter, is will it be able to um, sustain the subscriber growth that has been that we saw that we've been seeing over the course of the last 12 months? That will be the big test. Currently, Netflix subscribers are now north of 200 million. 203.7 now the american market is saturated there's not much growth potential there but certainly international markets it's continuing to grow market share the company is also saying it's looking to target an operating margin of 20 percent 
as well as being cash flow positive by the end of this year. Now, that's highly ambitious, but these numbers will give us a decent indication as to whether or not Netflix is it's on, it, on its way to, to achieving that goal. Downside risks as we look ahead to Q2 are likely to be a slowdown in subscriber growth as economies come out of their winter lockdowns and we start to go outdoors more and cinemas start to reopen. I think that's the big problem. So I think we could well start to see Netflix management start to become a little bit more circumspect about their growth numbers as we look ahead to the rest of this year. So that could mean that the share price that we've seen, which has been pretty boring over the course of the last six months, will continue to trade sideways, albeit with a slightly negative bias towards the downside. Now, I'm going to talk about Johnson & Johnson. Why? Because Johnson & Johnson has hit the news recently because of its Janssen jab. It's a one-shot COVID jab. It's, and it's you know fundamentally different from every other vaccination shot out there, which are two jabs. This is a one jab shot, but like AstraZeneca, it's an adenovirus and there are concerns about blood clots. So it'll be interesting to hear what Johnson & Johnson have to say about that when they announce their first quarter numbers on the 20th of April. Um, the company opt is optimistic about its fiscal year forecasting. Revenues are expected to rise to around about 82 and a half billion to over 90 and a half billion dollars for the new fiscal year. So obviously divide that by four, give you a decent indication of where they expect um, quarterly revenues to come in. And first quarter profits are expected to come in around about $2 a share. But certainly in the context of where we are at the moment, we're in a nice little uptrend. It'd be interesting to see whether or not they're able to shrug off the concerns and get approval from US regulators and European regulators for their single shot jab. Uh, it's Johnson & Johnson. We've also got Taylor Wimpy. Uh, Taylor Wimpy has been a bit of a strange one when it comes to the recovery in the housing market. We are still well below the peaks in house building shares that we were a year ago. And that's not surprising simply, the, simply by virtue of the fact that completions have been lower which is not surprising because the construction sector did briefly close um, over the course of one month between March and April of last year while they adapted um, their working practices to be more COVID friendly. Operating costs have gone up. Taylor Wimpy's margins almost halved from 18, 19% to around about 10% in their last annualized numbers. This first quarter trading update um, should give us an indication as to whether or not they've been able to start to widen those margins out again. They are looking to um, restore those operating margins back to around about 18% by the end of this year, with a view to getting them up to 21 or 22% by 23, 24. Certainly, we've broken towards the upside. The housing market still looks fairly strong, um, and the stamp duty holiday has been extended. So, um, there are significant um, tailwinds with respect to um, Taylor Wimpy. We've also got Primark, Astra, uh, Associated British Foods. Their stores are starting to reopen, so that will be um, a significant boost to Associated British Foods. Um, their, their other business areas have actually done quite well. Um, grocery, sugar and agriculture have all been ahead of expectations. Closed retailers has been a little bit of a drag with loss of sales of around, around about 1.1 billion pounds. So um, they will be hoping for a significant rebound there. So um, that brings to an end, I think, this, uh, this preview of the week ahead. As you can see, quite a lot to get through, but nonetheless, um, plenty to talk about. So um, keep an eye Keep an eye on bond yields over the course of the next uh, few days. If we continue to um, if we continue to move lower, then that's obviously going to be fairly positive in terms of inflation risk of inflation expectations. And obviously, keep an eye out for um, any other potential um, sterling weakness as well, given the fact that we've come off the back of some significant declines over the course of the past few days. 
So that's it for this week. Thank you very much for listening. This is Michael Houston talking to you from CMC Markets. Have a great weekend.